After departing from this world to a better place, this guy gets a second chance and reincarnates into a magical world. But that's not all. The goddess of reincarnation promised him an overpowered ability. However, when he's born, they discover that his magical level is quite low. Nevertheless, the truth is that the goddess didn't lie and that's what we'll see now. Having suffered a lot of bullying in elementary school, this boy stopped going to school and lost all hope for the future, living aimlessly until one day he encounters the goddess of reincarnation congratulating him. Despite going solo in his room, it was decided that he would be reincarnated into a new world, where magic reigns supreme. So the goddess is going to give him an overpowered ability to make his life easier. She tells him to make the most of his new life, and deep down, all he wants is to live peacefully. The guy spends his days watching anime and playing video games until he falls asleep. And for him, this is the best way to live. So he accepts reincarnation and plans to use this overpowered ability to have an easy life. When he finally wakes up in the new world, the boy realizes he's still a newborn, the child of a king and queen. In other words, a prince. His parents are thrilled because they find him a beautiful child and see the royal mark on the baby's left chest. Then a hooded woman uses a crystal ball to perform a magical assessment and determine the boy's mana level. The king believes that his mana level will be high since he's the son of a king and the princess of light, the woman who defeated the demon king, so the mana level should be above 40 or 50. However, the crystal ball shows a level of 02 and no elemental affinity, which means he can only use barrier magic. The king is confused and thinks this will become a laughingstock. The queen agrees that this cannot become news, so they decide to declare that the prince was born breach. Despite being a baby, the boy is conscious and understands what's happening. So the king orders one of the servants to leave the baby in the forest. Meanwhile, the goddess is very concerned because she gave him overpowered abilities, and no one noticed, as the magic measuring device only shows two digits. She also forgot to give him an element, must be an intern's mistake. However, the boy's true magic level is 1002. In the forest, the poor child is in a wooden crib and is in trouble because he can't move yet. He remembers that they mentioned barrier magic and decides to try it. The boy concentrates until he forms a Q-shaped barrier around himself. Then he tries to change the size, color, and shape of the barrier and realizes that the only limit is his imagination. It's almost like the power of the Green Lantern's ring. As he wonders if he can use this power on himself, the boy brings the barrier to his own body and manages to use it to float as if he has telekinesis. Suddenly, a giant canine monster appears and tries to attack the boy but he protects himself with the barrier. It also creates several smaller cubes and launches them at the monster, but the attack isn't very effective. Then he uses the barriers to move trees and launches into attack, this time knocking down the creature. However, the beast quickly gets up, so the boy decides to use his power on a massive piece of land. Seeing this, the creature pleads for mercy in a feminine voice. The boy doesn't know where the voice is coming from, but soon realizes it's the creature speaking. Now with more calm, she explains that she tried to feed on him to replenish her mana, but she didn't know he was so strong. She asks if he is, but the boy still can't speak, so he decides to create a barrier that turns thoughts into voice and places it in his throat. Finally, he can speak. The boy remembers that his parents had given him the name Reinhardt, but it's kind of complicated, so he decides to choose his own name, Haruko. He explains to the creature that he was abandoned because of his low mana level, but she senses much more powerful magic than that of ordinary humans emanating from him. With that, the creature deduces that Haruto is the reincarnation of the Demon King. To gain some favor, the boy confirms that he is the Demon King. So the creature admits defeat and offers her life. Haruno finds this too cruel and says that she just shouldn't attack him again. What the boy didn't expect is that the creature now feels indebted to the Demon King's generosity and offers to protect him finally introducing herself as Fenrir of Fire. Soon, the boy nicknames her Flay. When Harunu prepares to leave, the creature warns him that since he not only spared her life, but also gave her a new name, it means they form a pact, he is now her master. The boy tries to explain that he just gave her a nickname to shorten it, but she doesn't listen to that. Before their conversation continues, the boy goes to the ground because he has a problem that can't be solved with magic. The baby is hungry. Flay wants to help her master, so she transforms into a human because she believes he needs breast milk. She becomes a red-haired woman, but with wolf ears and tail. Embarrassed, Haruto tells her to get dressed, but to be sure, he creates another barrier in the shape of a dark cube that fits her body like modern clothing. Obviously, Flay's plan goes wrong because she became a human but doesn't have a newborn child, meaning she can't produce milk. Suddenly, Flay realizes someone is approaching and finds a guy in armor who says he's there to get the child. She refuses because he has just become her master. Still, the man says he's a relative of the boy and decided to save the child. When questioned by Flay, 
he says it's out of compassion and even brings a bit of milk because he thought the boy might be hungry. He's indeed famished, but the woman feels offended because she wanted to help her master. The man then says she doesn't seem capable of raising a human baby and explains that he cares for the child due to a personal story. His wife had lost a child during pregnancy, and it was very sad for them. However, this boy was only abandoned because of his low magical potential, and to him, every child that's born deserves to live. Flay is moved by this tragic story, so the man makes a proposal. Since she wants the boy as her master so much, Flay can come work at his house. She agrees because there isn't much else she can do. Before they leave, the man destroys the crib and makes it look like the child was attacked. Nine years later, we see Haruto's new family having breakfast. The adoptive father who saved him that day is Marquis Gold, and now he has a little sister named Charlotte. The boy initially intended to leave once he was past the breastfeeding stage, but ended up staying because of the kindness and comfort he found with them. Despite everything, he feels like his sister hates him. Meanwhile, Flay indeed works as a maid serving the family, and Charlotte is very fond of her. When the girl asks to play outside with Flay, the redhead initially refuses, but Haruto tells her to go, so she agrees since he's the master. While watching the two play, Haruto is approached by his adoptive mother, who tells him not to feel bad. She knows that Charlotte is awkward around her brother, but she thinks it's because the girl doesn't know how to act around boys her age. With that, Haruto begins to theorize that his little sister has noticed that deep down he's actually a nearly 30-year-old guy. His mother then suggests that the boy do something special for his sister to maybe change the way she sees him. Later in his room with a clone made from his magical barrier, the boy reflects on how he wants to be independent but can't leave because Flay would go with him, and Charlotte would hate him even more. Anyway, he can't convince the redhead to stay if he leaves. The problem is, by staying in this place, he'll start to have a lot of responsibilities soon. It's revealed that over the years, Haruto has studied a lot about barrier magic and created a robot clone of himself, but he can't speak or move, so it's useless. Also, if he wants to leave and leave this clone behind, he would need to make one of Flay as well. Suddenly, his father calls him from outside the room. They come to a courtyard where the man wants to teach him how to use a sword. Since the boy has a very low level magic, he needs to develop other skills. At least, that's what the guy thinks. Gold asks if the boy has any specific interests and Haruto says he's been studying ancient magic. Still, the Marquess wants to test if he has any talent with a sword, so they begin training with a wooden sword. Haruto knows that his father is an experienced warrior known as the Thunderous Warhammer, so the boy wonders if he can hit the guy. As he doesn't want to feel pain, he first uses a barrier to surround his body. In the first attack, the boy jumps very high and almost hits the man, but since he forgot to cover the sword with a barrier, it breaks when he hits the ground. Gold is impressed with the boy's strength because he created a small crater where he hit the sword. Then he prepares to attack as well and says he'll stop the attack just before hitting, but the boy should try to dodge. The man takes his stance and makes the attacking motion, but the boy shows incredible agility, jumping much higher. However, the man said he would stop the attack but went all out. With that, the Marquess reveals that there was no way the boy could have dodged without being at least level 30. So we learn that Haruto himself suspected that he had more power than they say, thinking that maybe he could have three digits in his mana level, but he only found a sphere that read 002. Since they say the highest level for humans is 77, he doesn't think he can have four digits. Haruno also confirmed that he has no elemental affinity, and he concluded that it's precisely this lack of an element that allows him to use magic very efficiently. He suspects that maybe this is the overpowered ability the goddess mentioned. Back in the present, the man says that the boy will continue training until he becomes a first-rate swordsman. Later, he talks to his wife about Haruto's performance on the first day of training and suspects that the boy might be the reincarnation of some demon. According to secret reports from the royal family, Someone had a connection with a demon in the past. It's rare, but there are people born with demonic traits. Despite the boy not having horns or a tail, there are rumors that the royal mark possesses unknown powers. The fact that Flay respects the boy so much could be another piece of evidence, but the couple still prefers to believe that Haruto is just a normal child. Charlotte was sleepy but overheard the conversation and is sure that her brother is no demon. One day at home, Haruto was chilling in his room when he heard commotion outside. He used barriers as surveillance screens and saw a bunch of wounded soldiers at the castle entrance. When he talked to his father, Gold, the man explained that the province was having trouble with bandit attacks. They had gone to resolve the issue but were ambushed and caught off guard. Gold was frustrated because they had followed all the protocols and still got defeated, having to flee with the wounded. The man thought this scene was too harsh for his nine-year-old son, but we know that Haruto is an old soul on the inside. 
The redhead, Flay, was impressed by what they had suffered at the hands of the bandits and ended up questioning Gold's efficiency without realizing it. Upon hearing this, Haruga, with a somber aura, told her to shut up. He walked among the wounded and used healing barriers to restore them all. The power of these barriers knows no limits. No one understood what had happened, not even Gold. Later, the boy woke up and left his room, finding Flay standing at the door, not saying anything. He quickly realized it was because of the order he had given earlier, so he told her she could speak and apologize because he had been irritated at that time. The woman also apologized because she felt she had offended him in that moment. They both went to the terrace, where he used barriers to search for the bandits who must be near the site of the attack. He found some suspicious guys, but some looked like regular soldiers. Flay surprised him by theorizing that there might be someone providing information to the invaders like a spy. Then the boy used other barriers to make the two of them fly, but he didn't realize that his little sister, Charlotte, had seen this. At the bandit's base, the guys were boasting and celebrating what they had done, when suddenly Haruto and Flay appeared on the scene. He immediately paralyzed everyone with invisible barriers and pushed one bandit against the wall so hard that it shattered part of the stones just to assert dominance. When he interrogated the guys, the boy discovered that they were soldiers from the neighboring empire who had infiltrated the kingdom with the intention of causing internal chaos. The soldiers also revealed that there was an accomplice among the border guards, and that's how they managed to invade, but they didn't know who it was. Knowing that someone would need higher authority than gold to do this, Haruna wondered if someone in the kingdom wanted to get rid of his father. The soldiers promised to retreat, but the boy didn't want to show mercy, and told Flay to set the entire fortress on fire. The guys tried to explain that they were following orders, but Haruto didn't care. He only knew that these soldiers had ambushed his father, and he wouldn't forgive anyone for that. Flay said that this was the price for bothering the master and proceeded to do what the boy had ordered. The two of them walked away afterward and talked about what was happening. Haruto didn't know much about the Empire's soldiers and conflicts between nations, but he was calm because they had started it. He also decided to send an anonymous letter to his father explaining what had happened in the fortress. The next day, Gold received the news that the bandits had been eradicated, and that the fortress had been burned, although some had managed to escape. He was also aware that the enemies were Imperial soldiers. After the messenger left, Charlotte asked her father who had taken care of the bad guys, but the man didn't know, though he suspected Flay because of her significant firepower. Charlotte remembered something and walked away. She wanted to know who her brother really was. The girl found Flay and got straight to the point asking who her brother really was. Since this was sudden, the redhead thought the girl might be out of her mind, but Charlotte was no fool and revealed that she had seen the silhouettes of her and her brother flying the night before. She had thought her brother wouldn't have enough mana to fly, and when she checked his room, he was sleeping. But this time, she didn't feel his usual eerie aura. Charlotte asked what this meant, and Flay was impressed that the girl had already noticed her brother's power. She explained that the aura Charlotte felt was Haruto's extraordinary mana, a power that went far beyond human limits, even beyond what she, a demon, could match. In other words, Haruto was incredibly powerful. But when Charlotte asked if Flay knew who her brother really was, the woman said she did but couldn't tell. To avoid more questions, she warned Charlotte that if she worried too much about the details, she would stop growing. Obviously, Flay relayed all of this to Haruto, who now worried about the girl's suspicions. So he decided to set up a monitoring barrier and configured an alarm based on what happened to Charlotte. Flay also wanted to know why there were two Harudos, but the boy told her not to worry. Later, he pretended to go to the bathroom, but it was all a plan to see if Charlotte would follow him. The boy decided that the best thing to do was simply to ask her why she was doing this. However, when he tried to talk to her, the girl ran off without looking back. Despite this, Charlotte continued to watch her brother and follow him all the time, trying to remain hidden. The days went by and she persisted in her surveillance until one day, Gold announced that Charlotte and Natalia, their mother, were going to an annual festival. Usually, Gold went to this festival himself, but this time, they were going his place. The boy suggested sending Flay with them, but Natalia mentioned that she hadn't seen the redhead in the past few days, so the boy remembered that he had sent Flay to intimidate the monsters in the forest to prevent them from attacking the cities and villages. With no other option, they proceeded with the plan. However, as expected, shortly afterward, the alarm from the barrier that Haruto had placed on Charlotte went off, and he saw that his mother and sister were under attack. The guards tried to hold off the enemies so that the woman could escape with the girl, but some Imperial soldiers managed to follow them. They fired magical shots that the woman defended with a barrier but was lightly wounded in the foot. Suddenly, a barrier appeared near Charlotte's ear, and the girl began guiding her mother to an escape route. The woman followed what her daughter was saying without knowing who might be guiding the girl or how it was happening. They reached a cliff and the girl said they should descend. 
The woman used magic to slow their descent, so they descended slowly to the ground. Natalia was almost out of mana, but the girls said they were almost there and pointed to a small cave where they could hide. Upon arriving in the cave with her daughter, she noticed that the cave was illuminated by a luminous moss that seemed to have grown excessively. The problem was that they couldn't hide well because it was so bright. She then had the brilliant idea to try to find the person who had guided her daughter, so she told Charlotte to wait in that place. Natalia commented that she was sure the person who had helped them was a hero of justice, someone who punished evil people. In an effort to find this person, she told the girl to wait there. Charlotte didn't want her mother to go, but the woman said everything would be okay and that she would protect her no matter what. The poor girl even begged her mother not to go, but the woman ran out. Outside, she realized that the entrance to the cave had been covered by advanced illusion magic, meaning that if she had stayed inside, no one would have noticed. The problem was that, at that moment, the Imperial soldiers appeared and found Natalia. She didn't want to be captured, so she decided to take a drastic measure. She pulled out a dagger and the soldiers immediately warned her not to resist. However, instead of that, Natalia pointed the blade at herself. When she was about to cut herself, the knife shattered and she fainted, being held by Haruto, who had just arrived. Irritated, he knocked down all the soldiers with a single attack and quickly arrived in the cave carrying his mother. Charlotte was hiding behind a rock. The boy didn't introduce himself but said that Natalia was alive but unconscious. He also informed them that help would arrive soon. At this point, the girl was already feeling his intimidating aura, so she knew it was Haruto. Recognizing that he had saved them, Charlotte came out of hiding and called her brother before he left. The boy replied immediately and showed his face. Now there was no way to hide it, and when Charlotte asked if he was the hero of justice, Harugo, who was already shaken because this was their first conversation, confirmed it. Now the girl was relieved because her brother's extraordinary power was meant to deal with the bad guys. She approached and said she had been completely wrong about him. Harugo then asked her to keep his secret because no one could discover his identity. She readily agreed and casually mentioned that she would have to lie to their father, which left the boy with a guilty conscience, but now he had to finish the job outside. At night, Gold received the news about what had happened, but was informed that Natalia and Charlotte were fine and being escorted by Flay at the moment. Furthermore, some guards had been injured but were instantly healed. Gold wanted to thank the person who had done this, but it seemed they had no intention of revealing themselves. He asked Haruto what he thought about it. So the boy said he believed the person would continue to be on their side if they didn't do anything wrong. He also commented that even if they were Imperial soldiers pretending to be thieves, this hero would take care of it. The father asked how he knew they were Imperial soldiers, but the boy played it cool, saying he had guessed because they had gone after his mother, but everything was very strange. Gradually, he led his father to question how the guys had infiltrated even with all the security measures Gold had implemented at the border. First, the man wondered if they had infiltrated before the security measures, but then he realized that someone had switched sides. The boy confirmed it, and Gold mentioned how it seemed like Haruto wasn't just a regular nine-year-old, that's because he's an old soul on the inside. The man commented on how someone with a double life was finally spreading their wings, but the conversation was interrupted when Charlotte arrived, all cheerful, with the other two. Suddenly, the girl hugged her brother and said she had missed him, making her parents wonder about this sudden closeness. She explained that it was just a phase and everything depended on the stage of life. With all this attachment, Flay showed a certain jealousy of the bond between her and the master, while the parents burst into laughter. As days passed, Charlotte grew much closer to Haruto, visiting his room almost every day. She displayed a great fondness for her brother, who now didn't quite know how to handle her, but in reality, he didn't know how to deal with her when she didn't like him either, so not much had changed. Nevertheless, the boy didn't mind much, it was as if she were a cherished pet, showing a lot of affection. Upon seeing a barrier with the image of a watchman that Haruto had been using, Charlotte questioned if this was ancient magic, and he confirmed it, although he had forgotten that he had told his father he was studying ancient magic. The boy mentioned that it was complicated since it was a lost and unrecorded magic, but Charlotte stated that there were records and she had seen some things in the castle's library. They went to the library and she started searching among the shelves, pulling out a few volumes. Later, they both stopped to take a look. The boy read something about ancient magic being of non-elemental nature, while modern magic complemented it with the four elements. With this, he believed that barrier magic was indeed related to ancient magic in some aspects. Charlotte, on the other hand, commented that there were many theories about ancient magic, but she found this theory the most interesting. Hermito asked if she had read this book, even though it had difficult words and Charlotte mentioned that she had help from her mother in Flay. Then she asked her brother to read it to her too. So Haruto decided to put his big brother's skills to use and began reading the book to his little sister. They found information about the existence of gods who could travel between different worlds. 
The boy recognized that he had seen this before in an anime and mentioned that he missed it because it had been a long time since he had watched anything. That would be his only complaint about living in this world. Imagine living in a world without being able to watch any anime. I couldn't handle it. As the boy mentioned anime out loud, Charlotte asked what it was. He tried to say that it would take a long time to explain and she probably wouldn't understand. The girl promised to do her best to listen and pay attention to what he said. Haruto ended up giving in. The problem was that he got carried away and talked about colorful and scanned frames that were arranged in order to create an animation where basically the images moved and talked. Realizing that he had said too much, the boy thought his sister would find him strange, but instead, she became interested, thinking that everything he had talked about was some kind of special magic. Finally, Charlotte asked him to show it to her. Haruto also became a bit excited to try watching an anime again, and the girl was happy to see her brother so enthusiastic. Mentally, the boy thanked his own mother for raising Charlotte to be a good girl. He promised to do his best to show her an anime, and two weeks later, we see that the guy simply used barrier magic to create a connection to modern Japanese internet. Luckily, his streaming subscription was still active, so the boy created a child profile for his sister. Excited, she chose an anime with a cute girl and was impressed with the moving and talking images. Haruto was also happy that she liked it. Charlotte's only complaint was that she didn't understand what was being said, and Haruto remembered that nobody in this world understood Japanese. She asked him to teach her, and he thought it would be complicated. But since Charlotte was five years old, she might learn quickly. And he was right, in just two hours of studying, his sister had already mastered some basic Japanese symbols and could even type a search query into the search engine, looking up the meaning of justice. This left the boy truly impressed. Two weeks later, Charlotte was already getting addicted to a zombie anime that also included some Power Rangers-like heroes in the same story. Although things like trains and cars did make sense to her, she could understand the context by following the story's flow. What was most impressive was that, in these two weeks of watching anime, she had practically already mastered the Japanese language. Horuno began to wonder if his sister was some kind of genius, but if that were the case, he worried about letting her watch an eye for so long, even though she was having so much fun with it. He needed to be a responsible older brother, even if it meant being a bit strict. At the end of an episode, when the girl was about to start the next one, Haruto didn't allow it anymore and said that she could only watch TV for three hours a day. Charlotte was shocked by this information and even though Haruto tried to explain that watching too much TV wasn't healthy for children, she insisted. However, the boy stood firm in his decision and reminded her that it was time for dinner. At the dinner table, the girl was quite sleepy and their parents, knowing that the siblings were spending a lot of time together, asked what they had been doing. Charlotte said they were studying ancient magic, and her mother was happy that her little daughter was able to help her older brother. After dinner, the girl accompanied Haruto in the corridor, but he told her that she couldn't watch more than even if she went to his room, which left her somewhat frustrated. After her bath, Charlotte said goodnight to her brother, but after he lay down, she ended up sleeping in his room. Seeing this, their mother was happy to see the siblings getting along so well, while poor Haruto just wanted to be able to sleep in peace. The next day, Marquis Gold went out to apprehend some criminals. Charlotte was a little worried, but Haruto explained that this time the criminals were commoners and wouldn't pose much of a challenge for their father. The girl asked why they had become criminals, and he explained that according to their father, there were power struggles in the kingdom. Charlotte asked if there was no way to make everyone live happily, but Haruto replied that that was what everyone wanted, but it wasn't so easy. This led her to question whether Haruto himself could accomplish this if he joined the fight. She thought his powers should be used for that purpose. The boy understood that she must have seen something like this in an anime, and after some insistence from the girl, Haruto reluctantly agreed. She asked him to transform, so the boy used magic to don a dark suit and a mask, standing at the height of an adult, to me. The costume was clearly inspired by Code Geese. Charlotte wanted to join her brother in action, but he didn't allow it and let her watch through a surveillance barrier. Interestingly, he remembered to modify his voice with this suit to avoid suspicion. The first thing the supposed hero did was search for the criminals through the surveillance images. After finding them, he blocked their escape. This would have been sufficient help, but Haruto knew that Charlotte wanted to see her brother in action, so he decided to go to the scene where the criminals initially underestimated the hero of justice, but they regretted it after getting beaten up. The boy got carried away and defeated them all, which was a bit worrisome with the little girl watching, but at least there was no bloodshed. Next, Gold arrived with some soldiers and saw that all the criminals had been defeated. Haruto didn't know what to say, but after the Marquis introduced himself and asked for the boy's name, Haruto tried to come up with something quickly, but ended up introducing himself as still pending. Gold asked if it was he who saved his wife and daughter, and the hero neither confirmed nor denied it.
but the man asked him to at least state his objective. With that, he said that he was an executor of justice, here to maintain justice, spread the word of justice, and serve justice. Inside, Haruto found it embarrassing, but he flew away and returned home tired. Unfortunately, the charlotte's excitement, the boy ended up forcing himself into battle several times, catching several criminals and becoming known as the Black Knight, another likely reference to Code Geese. This is how he gained a new identity and became his little sister's hero. One day, Haruto finally managed to create a talking and moving robot duplicate, thanks to his study of ancient magic through the library books. He was excited about the possibility of isolating himself whenever he wanted. Suddenly, Charlotte appeared on his bed and greeted her brother, but she was startled by the two Harutos who could speak and move. The conversation was interrupted when they were called for an appointment. He tried to send the clone in his place, but to his dismay, the duplicate had the same personality and refused to go. Outside, they met an arrogant boy who complained about the dust in the area and expressed disdain for the castle being in the countryside. A girl who was with him was more polite and even reprimanded him for being rude. These two were Princess Marianne and Prince Laius. While Gold greeted them, Haruno wondered if these were his biological siblings. Laius was annoyed at not being treated differently despite being the future king, but Marianne continued to reprimand her brother for his behavior, although he bragged that she was nothing more than a political tool. Inside, Haruto wondered how his brother had grown and become so foolish, but the prince noticed him staring and started making fun of him, asking if he was the level 2 scum adopted from an orphanage. Laius said he wanted to teach him some manners and challenged him to a duel. Gold said it wasn't necessary, but the prince promised to go easy on him. They prepared with wooden swords, and before the fight began, Haruto checked the boy's level through a mana assessment barrier. Laius's magic level was 9, with a maximum potential of 40. They said the greatest mage in this world had a level of 77. Haruno also saw that his father had a level of 32, which was already his maximum, while Marion had a level of 14 out of 33. Therefore, he concluded that his brother's level was quite high. Laius started attacking, but Haruto dodged, so the prince complained that he couldn't punish him that way. The boy then prepared with his self-enhancement magic and allowed his brother to strike him multiple times, pretending to be in pain. However, when Laius began to boast and told Haruto to fight back if he could, the boy obeyed and displayed insane agility, quickly moving behind his brother before knocking him down with a single sword strike. Laius tried to retaliate, but Haruto was literally on another level. Marion asked their uncle if he was really level 2 as he would need advanced self-enhancement magic to move so quickly. Gold wasn't sure and Haruto himself seemed uncertain, so he simply accepted it. In anger, Laius conjured a fireball and attacked, but Haruto created a barrier that absorbed the flames. This left the prince confused and he continued to throw fireballs with no effect. Haruto then revealed that he had absorbed all the fire with his own magic and asked if he could return it, showing a giant fireball that had formed by combining all the absorbed flames. Thus, Laius surrendered and Haruto decided to return to his room to relax. Marianne apologized for her brother's behavior and asked if Haruto was really a level 2, to which he replied yes before leaving. As he walked to his room, the boy reflected on how the people in the royal capital already knew he was a level 2, and he wondered if his biological parents were investigating him. However, since the couple had abandoned him without a second thought, he didn't think they would do that. With recent tasks as a hero to please his sister, Haruto ends up getting into a problem he didn't expect. Charlotte is taking these patrols very seriously, and as a result, the boy's life is becoming chaotic. On top of all that, Flay also found out and now wants to accompany the master on missions. Haruto thought she was busy, but the demon woman has already finished the tasks he had assigned. Because of this, Charlotte is excited to see them joining forces, just like in stories where a companion always saves the hero in trouble. Flay knows she can't compare to the boy's powers, but she can certainly help a lot. With the insistence of both, the boy eventually gives in. But as they prepare for their first mission together, Haruto tells Flay not to be too violent while Charlotte is watching, so the woman agrees. Men see the bandits Charlotte encountered on the watchtowers. Haruto, dressed as the Black Knight, emerges from the shadows and makes an exaggerated entrance in front of the men. This time, his companion also appears. It's Flay, who introduces herself as the Scarlet Knight. The problem is, she gets carried away and tries to turn the bandits into ashes right away, kind of ignoring the part about not using excessive violence. The only way Haruto can prevent the worst from happening is by protecting the bandits with a barrier, preventing the redhead's new flames from hurting them. When she prepares an even stronger attack, the boy uses Chaplin's bionic hammer to get her attention and remind her of what they had agreed on regarding excessive violence. The woman says she understands, but that everyone who hinders her master is an enemy, 
so she didn't really understand. Harujo then says she's done enough and he'll finish the job on his own, but she admires her master so much that she wants to stay and watch. Even so, he orders her to leave. Afterward, the poor boy is very tired as the workload has doubled with this new companion, but Charlotte is becoming more excited about this partnership. Flay comments that she attacked with all her power, but something interfered, preventing her from being useful to her master. So now she's more determined to do a good job next time. Deep down, Haruto doesn't want there to be a next time, but Charlotte is already eager for this kind of mission to happen again. This leaves the boy in an internal conflict between making his sister happy and doing things the right way. In reality, he just wants to have a peaceful, reclusive life. Meanwhile, Prince Laius is upset about losing to Haruto in their duel, as he thought the guy was only at level 2. At that moment, a royal assistant, along with other employees, appears to announce the banquet, and while the boy gets ready, he suggests inviting Charlotte for a visit the next day. Obviously, the boy is against this idea, but the man says it's for his own good. At night, Charlotte enters her brother's room, letting him know that the banquet is over. She and the clone bring a bowl of luxurious food for him. The clone complains about being forced to attend the banquet. As they are practically the same person, the real Haruto must know how unpleasant it was. The clone can't stand doing everything he doesn't like anymore. After he collapses on the bed, the girl mentions that she was invited for a visit the next day. The first thought that crosses Haruto's mind is whether Laius has other intentions. In any case, given the clone's condition, the boy will have to go along. Later, he begins to check the travel route and finds a group of hooded mages around a large, summoning circle. So he decides to take a closer look. When the boy appears disguised as the Black Knight, everyone is startled. He asks if they have Marqua's authorization and that's enough to reveal that these guys are enemies. They prepare to attack, but if someone starts a fight against Furuto, we already know the result, no matter how many men there are. Even with everyone on the ground, one of the hooded figures summons skeletons in the magic circle. The boy uses a sword to deal with these undead but it's not so easy. They reassemble after being struck and return to the fight. When they swarm around the Black Knight, he uses a barrier to push them all away at once. At that moment, Haruto notices some red orbs on the chests of the skeletons and decides to try something. Suddenly, all the skeletons stop and turn against their summoners. No one knows what happened, so one of them summons a golem that easily defeats the skeletons and then attacks Haruto. Unfortunately, this time the barrier doesn't hold for long and breaks with the golem's punch, sending the boy flying against a tree. Haruto knows that this only happened because he lowered his defenses too much against the golem, so now he's thinking about how to deal with this new opponent. From a distance, the boy also sees a red orb in the creature's chest, so he jumps high and creates a barrier in the form of a stake to hit that target precisely. Just like the skeletons, the golem also turns against the summoners and begins to attack the men. One of them asks what's happening, so the Black Knight explains that he put a stake-shaped barrier that was enough to change the creature's own magic formula. The man is impressed that he managed to override their formula. Now that everything is calmer, Haruto begins to look for the leader. He commands the skeletons to tie up all the men with ropes, but he doesn't have much success in the interrogation. He then tries a more intimidating approach. Under the boy's command, the skeletons dig a hole and start throwing the men inside before covering them with dirt. Meanwhile, Haruto questions the last man who hasn't been thrown in. This is enough for the guy to spill the beans and reveal that he's from the Queen's Direct Summoners Unit. They were making preparations for the invocations to attack the visiting group in the agricultural lands. When questioned about the real objective, the man ends up revealing that they were going to eliminate Charlotte. He also reveals that the girl has a magical aptitude that could one day surpass the Queen's, and the Queen is afraid that with the Marquis's support, the kingdom will split in two. They were using the Imperial soldiers, but since they failed twice, the Queen's summoners had to take action. With this information, the boy remembers the soldiers who attacked Gold, as well as those who attacked Charlotte and her mother, and all of this was the work of that woman. He also recalls that they abandoned him as a baby, and all of this is because the Queen is the type who does everything to maintain her status. Anger fills Haruto's heart, and as a reaction, the Golem starts attacking the man, but the boy calms down and stops the creature, realizing that he almost lost control. Of course, he won't forgive those who want to take away what's most precious to him, even if the person is his biological mother. The next day, we see Flay being carried on a carriage while the four children ride inside. Innocently, Charlotte tells Laius not to be sad about losing to Haruto. She says the prince never had a chance against him and should actually be proud to have lost that duel. His sister, Marion, also agrees that it's not shameful to lose. Haruto tries to defuse the situation, but now Laius is already angry. He doesn't want anyone to pity him. Now speaking seriously, Prince Laius asks about Haruto's magic. He tries to explain it in a somewhat confusing way, but neither of them understands, so they ask for a better explanation. 
Inside, Haruto finds it strange because even his parents accepted it when he explained it that way. At this point, Prince Laius theorizes that Haruto might be a reincarnated demon, as that would make sense in this case. Haruto doesn't quite understand, so Charlotte explains that when a demon and a human marry, their descendants can have demonic traits. Marianne confirms that demons do indeed exhibit extraordinary powers and high amounts of mana, but in Haruto's case, she doesn't see any obvious demonic traits. When they arrive in the wheat fields, the golden crops enchant Haruto's eyes as it's the first time he's seen a wheat field. In Japan, rice fields were more common. Charlotte is also very excited about the landscape and decides to go play, with Marianne joining her to watch over the girl. Flay becomes a bit jealous. After a while, with the other children a bit far away, Haruto calls his father for a conversation. They sit in isolation with only Flay nearby, and the boy gets straight to the point and asks what he would do if someone were after Charlotte. He apologizes for the sudden question, but the man understands that he has also noticed something. The truth is that Gold received a letter from the Black Knight the previous night, so he followed the instructions and found the Queen's mages. He knew she saw him as an enemy but didn't think she was after Charlotte. This woman wants to eliminate them, but there's nothing they can do because she's the queen. Haruto says that a cruel queen like that could disappear, but the Marquis says the kingdom would be in trouble without her. It turns out that King Jilk lost power a long time ago, and many nobles want to take the throne. They only don't do anything because the queen is absolute. With this, Haruto understands that if the queen were to be toppled, there would be internal wars in the kingdom. The man also reveals that two years before Haruto was born, an army led by the king went to face the demon king. Among them was Gizalot, who defeated the demon king and became the hero known as the Princess of Light. After that, she married the king, gaining even more support from the population. Now the Princess of Light wants the entire country just for herself. After hearing this story, Haruto understands how grandiose the woman was and regrets not researching anything just because he didn't want to get involved with his biological parents. The Marquess now comments that if someone strong were to appear to replace the queen, the story would change. The boy asks why Gold doesn't become the king himself, and he says he's not good at politics and wouldn't be suitable for it. However, there is someone who is too young, so he wants to wait until she becomes an adult. He says she is intelligent and will surely grow up well enough to lead a country. Deep down, Haruto knows he's talking about Charlotte. The man says that she has immeasurable abilities that she herself is unaware of, but can surpass the Princess of Light in magical power. Gold knows that Haruto is already aware of who he is and what he expects from his son. The boy confirms this, gets up, and is now determined to protect Charlotte until she becomes a great queen. After that, he'll be able to enjoy a quiet, reclusive life in this world. Later, Flay offers to eliminate the queen, but the boy says it's a matter between him and her so he needs to deal with it himself. The redhead says she'll be honored to witness that act. Inside, Haruto knows that the queen will continue to interfere in their affairs so he can't just think about protecting his little sister. It means that in 10 years, he'll be reunited with his parents. In the castle, the queen receives information about the Black Knight who is going after the bandits on the province's border. Men say that the summoner unit must have been attacked by him as well, but these guys are willing to make the knight pay. Suddenly, the queen throws a drink at the representative and comments that this is the third time they failed to eliminate a mere girl, mentioning Charlotte, who will grow up as a threat to the queen. Irritated with the Black Knight, the woman considers maybe taking him out with her own hands, using the sword she used against the Demon King. Suddenly, the voice of the Black Knight himself grabs the woman's and the guard's attention. They prepare to protect the queen, but soon fall under the barrier magic. He then approaches, and the woman mentions the various barriers that should have prevented him from entering. Arudo says he broke those half-baked things. The queen uses three magic circles simultaneously, just to make one appear beneath the man and conjure a large water sphere, intending to drown him inside it. However, Haruto uses a barrier to support his foot and jumps out of the sphere. The woman continues attacking now with ice, which he defends with a barrier, and then with fire, which the guy seems to take the attack unprotected. Nevertheless, after the conjuration ends, he gets up unharmed and acknowledges her as powerful, for wielding both a sword and multiple elements. The fact that the knight endured these attacks surprises the woman. Now it's Haruno's turn to attack, and he unleashes a wave of energy that nearly hits the queen, but she manages to block the attack at the last moment. The knight says he'll take it seriously and starts firing several shots in succession, forcing the woman to use multiple barriers to defend herself. Seeing that her opponent has an absurd amount of mana, the queen realizes he's more powerful than the demon king. With her mana running out, all that's left for the woman is to use the sword to attack, but the knight conjures his own weapon to defend, and thus the duel between the two armed with their blades begins. At a certain moment, the queen leaps high to deliver an attack from above. 
Harundo manages to defend, but the attack is so powerful that it brings both of them to the ground. The queen thinks she's the strongest person in the world, but the knight doesn't see it as a big deal and quickly disarms her. Next, he applies a punishment, placing a metal collar around her neck. Harundo warns her that if she tries to remove it by force, she'll lose her head, and he explains that this humiliation is to ensure she won't meddle with Marquis Gold anymore, nor with his family or territory. The collar will only come off when the knight forgives her, but if she disobeys, they both know what could happen. Finally, Harundo leaves, leaving the queen crying in humiliation. Flay congratulates the master's work, although she thinks he went easy, but it was good to see the Princess of Light losing that way. Harudo says that this should provide temporary peace, but they can't let their guard down, and next time he won't show mercy. Five years later, we see teenage Haruto with Flay and Charlotte enjoying the winter snow. It seems the threat worked, as after that, the queen stopped interfering. Charlotte makes a transformation brooch out of the snow, imitating something she saw in Anim. After all, she's still an otaku. To compete, Flay builds a snow castle, but it's identical to Marpa's actual castle. At that moment, Haruto asks if the redhead isn't cold in those clothes, as she's not wearing any warm clothing. She replies that she can't wear anything else because this was the first outfit she liked. The demon woman may be cold-resistant, but her human form can be inconvenient in this regard. So Haruto uses magic to give her warm clothing. He also tells her to let him know next time she needs something. With that, she starts to make a request, but the guy refuses even before hearing it. Now, Charlotte wants to ask for something. She says she came up with a special snow technique but can't use it, meaning she wants her brother to do it for her. When Harudo asks how it's done, she starts whispering in his ear. The guy then prepares to do what she asked. Actually, it's a technique involving poses and catchphrases to strike the ground with the snow attack, creating a large hole. Charlotte is delighted and hugs her brother, but the parents arrive and ask what that was. To avoid revealing their identity, Harudo creates a clone with the appearance of the Black Knight, who promptly flies away. Harbudo then says that this guy showed them one of his special techniques when he happened to pass by. Marquis decides to believe this flimsy explanation. Later, the guy asks his father if anything has happened lately, and he confirms that since the last incident, the queen hasn't attempted anything against Charlotte anymore. It seems she hasn't appeared in public in the last few years. There are rumors that she's been wearing a collar similar to a slave's initially thought to be an eccentric preference, but later it was believed that she might have put it on accidentally and can't take it off, or perhaps someone intentionally put it on her. So, Haruto is relieved that there's no more interference from the Empire. Hoping to achieve the reclusive life he always wanted, the guy decides to head to his room. However, his father starts another conversation, saying that starting in spring, Haruto will need to attend the capital school. Marcus explains that there are some complicated issues involved that he can explain later, but he couldn't refuse. However, Haruto says he doesn't want to go at all, remembering how he suffered in that kind of place in his past life. The poor guy collapses as his ideal life was almost within reach and now this happens. Since he has to go to school anyway, Haruto plans to destroy everything there so he can stay reclusive. Still, the guy continues to refuse Gold's request to attend the magic school. However, Gold shows the reason he can't refuse. A letter of recommendation from the king. It might seem strange that the king suddenly took an interest in Haruto, but Marquis thinks it's more for Princess Marianne's sake, and probably the king couldn't refuse a request from his daughter. Furthermore, Prince Laius will also attend and skip some grades to study alongside Harudo. In a letter, the king expressed the hope that they would study together and contribute to the kingdom's development, meaning the king wants the boys to become friends. Of course, Harudo isn't too thrilled about this, and Gold himself thinks the queen might be plotting something and using the princess for it. Nevertheless, as a father, Marcos would like his son to see more of the world and have more contact with other people. So, Haruto realizes that Gold has done a lot for him since he was adopted, and he also knows that refusing would be a problem, so he reluctantly accepts. Gold also suggests that he bring an assistant so he won't be alone in an unfamiliar place. They know it can't be Flay because that would only cause problems. Haruto might find some candidates, but it might not be good for him to start living with someone he doesn't know. At this point, Natalia appears at the door offering to go to take care of her son, but neither Haruto nor Gold agrees to this. In any case, they have three months until the start of classes to think it over. As for going to school, Haruto still plans to avoid it with an operation called I'm not going to school no matter what. The plan was to convince the clone to go in his place, but it won't be so easy to persuade him. Haruto argues that since the clone doesn't have magic, he can show he's useless and get expelled, because if it's for any other reason besides lack of skill, it could be bad for Gold's reputation. So, 
they should make it seem like the king made a mistake in recommending him for school. The clone suggests that Haruto could do that himself, but the guy imagines that with the magic he has, he might accidentally use it if some bully tries to pick on him. This wasn't a good argument as it makes it seem like it's fine if the clone gets beaten up. Haruto then says that if something happens to him, there are other substitutes, but that was just a joke because Charlotte wouldn't let him make more clones out of pity for the first one. So faced with the clone's childish tantrum, the guy decides to put a barrier on the clone to keep him from getting hurt, like I'll have to carry out the mission. The clone eventually agrees as he also wants a reclusive life and that's the only way. Sometime later, we see a wooden house near the lake on the other side of the mountain. Haruto spent five years building it with the goal of isolating himself. It's a very nice and peaceful place, and the guy can spend his time playing the video game he made himself. However, Charlotte shows up with Flay out of nowhere to watch an eye. While Flay takes care of the house, the girl watches, and the guy plays video games. After the episode ends, Charlotte mentions how she hasn't been around as much lately, and Haruto thought she had lost interest. The girl then explains that she has more lessons now, and they told her to stop going to her brother's room all the time. Seeing her sad, Haruto decides to help her by trying out a teleportation spell. He creates two barriers and throws a ball that passes through one barrier and exits through the other. Haruto knows this magic works over long distances, but has never tested it with a living being. So Flay suggests they test it with a clone since he was created to be useful to Haruto. He tries, but the clone refuses because he quickly understands what Haruto is planning. The clone even asks why Haruto himself doesn't go there. The truth is, he knows exactly what's going on in the guy's mind, and he quickly accuses him of being afraid of failing and getting stuck in another dimension. Mentioning that the guy is scared, the clone starts mocking him, which irritates Haruto. But it's Flay who acts without thinking, jumping through the portal to fight the clone and then tossing him back through the barrier. Now that the test has been done, Haruto creates a door with teleportation magic so that his sister can go directly there whenever she wants. However, he only now remembers that he needs to find an assistant for school, now that he remembered he needed an assistant to accompany him to the magic school, Haruto went for a walk and pondered the matter. He spotted something strange in the forest and decided to investigate. In this location, he stumbled upon a village of skeletons. These creatures gathered around when they saw the boy and welcomed him, addressing Haruto as Sir. This was happening because he had subjugated them during a battle against the Queen's Summers five years ago. After that battle, the skeletons had been following Haruto until he gave them land, and that's how the creatures settled in the area. The commander of this skeletal army was a skeleton named Johnny, and he was willing to help the boy if needed. Haruto first asked why there were other monsters in this village. Johnny explained that they were lost monsters with nowhere else to go. It was Flay who had brought these creatures from different places, but Haruto had nothing to worry about since they all followed Johnny's orders. The boy also noticed that the place was expanding, but he thought it would be fine as long as they stayed quiet. At this moment, Johnny invited him to see the other districts. It was revealed that there were large plantations and the skeletons were skilled at cultivation. The truth was, being essentially undead, they didn't need to eat, so everything they did was to provide for the other monsters. Johnny continued showing and commenting on everything happening between the districts, but at a certain point, Haruto wasn't paying much attention anymore. He only noticed the skeleton's personality, which was well-behaved, kind, meticulous, respected by all, and completely loyal. Even Johnny's voice was pleasing to Haruto's ears, and the boy thought that if he added a bit of flesh to him, he could be a perfect assistant. However, he gave up on the idea because despite the pleasant voice, he wouldn't be able to listen to the guy ramble all day. Suddenly, Johnny noticed the puzzled expression on Haruto's face and asked about it. The boy instead said he was impressed by how they handled things. Johnny was delighted with the compliment and made a joke about working hard as a bone. Then he offered to show the rest of the things, but Haruto claimed he had a commitment and bid farewell to the skeleton as he left. He sat near a lake, tired, and reflected on the place he had thought would be a quiet sanctuary for him, but had suddenly become a paradise for monsters. He wondered why nothing ever went as planned when suddenly a giant golem appeared, making the ground shake as it walked. The impact sent Haruto flying into the air. This golem was called Jigen, and it had also been summoned that night. For a while, the creature sat next to Haruto, and then gave him a flower, holding it delicately with his giant fingers. Haruto accepted it, and Jigen commented that he found it beautiful though his voice sounded like that of a little girl. Despite finding the voice strange, Haruto thanked him and realized that Jigen was more good-natured than he appeared. They never bothered the boy, so it could potentially be a good assistant if it weren't so enormous. Additionally, Haruto noticed that Jigen was always alone and wondered if the creature was okay. He asked Jigen if it was bored living in the village, but the creature replied that it liked the master. On the way back, Haruto became frustrated because finding a good assistant turned out to be more difficult than he thought. 
He went to the mountain cottage, and as soon as he entered, Flay asked about the word assistant he had mentioned before leaving but hadn't explained. Instead of trying to explain what an assistant was, he simply said it was none of her business. The next day, Charlotte suggested a worthy name for the Black Knight. She proposed the name Schwarzkrieger, or Shiva for short. Haruno realized this was German and Charlotte explained that it was the name of a supreme deity representing destruction and creation, which she thought would be perfect for him. Internally, Haruto apologized for what he was about to do to the daughter of a noble, and then he sent her with Flay to the monster village. Johnny explained the details of the place, and Charlotte praised her brother for setting aside a place for the monsters to live, even though most of the work had been done by Flay. Then she suggested a fitting name for the place, Pandemonium, which means Garden of Demons. Johnny thought the name was marvelous. Afterward, a snowstorm appeared in a cold area, where a blue dragon was fighting against some men who had surrounded it. This was a frost dragon, and the men wanted to hunt it for profit. However, the creature vanished suddenly into the storm, and when the men realized it, the dragon was already flying away. However, with many arrows in its body, the creature couldn't keep flying for long and crashed into a cliff, falling into a valley where snow and ice descended in an avalanche carrying the frost dragon in a stream. Down there, the monster became unconscious. Then, Haruto was at home talking to Marquis Gold about this blue dragon, which was apparently near the border but still within the Empire's territory. The problem was that the dragon was probably being hunted and could rebel and cause a lot of casualties if entered their territory. With this in mind, Gold told Flay to check the situation. She refused as she only obeyed Master Haruto's orders, so he told her to consider it his order. Still hesitant, she explained that such a large dragon was likely not very young, but she didn't know of any blue dragons, meaning that even during the demon-human wars, it must have stayed secluded in the mountains. She saw no reason to protect such a cowardly being. Understanding that it was a deep and personal matter for Flay, Karuno told his father he needed some time to think about it. When they left, they found Charlotte eavesdropping behind the door. The girl pleaded for the dragon, asking Flay to help it, as it must be feeling lonely and wounded. The demon woman remained reluctant, but Haruto mentioned that a request from Charlotte was also a request from him. Reluctantly, the redhead agreed to go, with the intention of dealing with all the adventurers. Haruto went with her, disguised as the Black Knight. He used surveillance barriers to locate the dragon, which appeared quite weakened. On another screen, they found the hunters closing in, and the dew hurried as time was running out. The men soon found the dragon and rushed towards it, some wielding weapons and others preparing to cast spells. However, just as they were about to reach the creature, the dew appeared to defend it. Haruto used recovery barriers to help the dragon while Flay raged against the group that had gathered to torment such a vulnerable creature. She prepared her firepower, intending to turn these men into ashes. But when she launched the attack, Haruto protected them with a barrier and tried to calm her down. With the hunters stunned, the Black Knight attempted to communicate with the dragon, but it breathed a freezing gust of air that froze him. Flay scolded the creature, but it was clear that Haruto wouldn't stay frozen for long, and he pretended to be outraged by her ingratitude. Hearing this, the Frost Dragon began to communicate telepathically with Haruto, as it had done with Flay when she was a baby. Haruto asked the creature for its identity, but it was more interested in why a demon like Flay was obeying a human. Flay then revealed everything about when she found Haruto, and after an hour of conversation believing that Haruto was indeed the reincarnated demon king, the Frost Dragon explained that it hadn't fought with the demons because it disliked combat. It had lived quietly at the base of the mountain, so that nobody would notice it for about 300 years. Impressed by the dragon's reclusion, Haruto asked for more details. The dragon told him that it initially stayed deep within a cave, but one day an adventurer slept there and left behind a book. The dragon read that book many times until it was completely worn out. Wanting to read more, it left the cave, sometimes taking on human form to obtain books from human cities. Over the years, it acquired vast knowledge and enjoyed itself immensely. However, not everything was pleasant. Adventurers eventually found its hideout, and in the ensuing conflict, piles of books were burned, prompting the dragon to flee. Flay was moved by the dragon's sad story and recognized it as her sister. She invited the creature to live in Pandemonium. At first, Haruto didn't understand the name, but Flay explained that it was the name Charlotte had given to the monster village. The dragon thanked them for the invitation and expressed gratitude for being saved, swearing loyalty to Haruto and accepting him as its master. The creature began to transform into a human and to avoid any issues with censorship here on the channel. Haruto used magic to give her clothing as the transformation completed. Thanks, Haruto. In human form, she appeared as a girl with blue hair and small horns. She was puzzled by the magic he used, but Haruto told her they could discuss it later. He finally removed his mask and introduced himself as Haruto Zenfis, the son of the neighboring province's Marquis. The dragon girl mentioned she didn't have a name and allowed him to name her as he wished. 
Thinking of the word blizzard from Snowstorm in English, Haruto named her Lisa, and the girl liked the name. At this point, Flay wanted to establish her dominance, saying she had served Haruto first and Lisa was second. However, when Haruto prepared to fly away, Lisa sprouted dragon wings and flew to accompany him. Haruto was intrigued that she could fly even in this form and didn't expect any less from a dragon. Out of jealousy, Flay decided not to be left behind and chased after them on foot. Haruto takes the dragon girl to the family castle and introduces her to his parents and Charlotte. Lisa agrees to work at the residence as a maid. Nathalia finds the dragon girl quite cute, and Charlotte also shows excitement in getting to know her new friend. Gold is impressed that this little girl is actually a dragon and that Haruto brought her home but sees no problem as long as she respects the castle's rules. So first, Flay takes Lisa to learn some tasks, saying that the work must be well done. First, she wants to test the new maid's skills, starting with cleaning the outdoor area. The redhead demonstrates how not to use a broom, breaking the handle with a few movements. However, when the novice tries to sweep the area, she ends up doing the cleaning very well. After that, it's time to do the dishes. The dragon girl quickly gets the hang of it and cleans everything properly, while the demon woman ends up breaking several dishes, or rather, she breaks all the dishes she tries to clean. Next, Flay tries to teach the newcomer how to cook, but what the redhead does is a disaster, causing a fire in the pan that only avoids becoming an inferno by sheer luck. On the other hand, as expected, Lisa can do this very well, impressing the other cooks and the whole family, who find the food delicious. Nathalia compliments the seasoning while Gold says that it's very impressive and poor Flay is left in the corner feeling jealous. The dragon girl also demonstrates her skills by helping Charlotte clean up, while her mother comments that the other maid said Lisa learns quickly. However, she remains modest and says that everyone teaches very well. When the woman asks what she is good at, Lisa thinks for a moment and says that she enjoys reading so she has acquired a lot of basic knowledge about magic and such things. Therefore, the blonde decides to make her Charlotte's personal maid. Gold agrees with the idea, so Lisa says she will do her best, while Flay becomes increasingly jealous. Soon, a new routine begins. Liza goes to the girl's room to wake her up and helps her change quickly, even showing a simple magic spell. The dragon girl demonstrates her water magic, and with effort, Charlotte manages to produce a small fireball. Liza also helps her with magic studies and even accompanies her during her bath. After a while, Charlotte can produce a much larger fireball. She shows it to her brother and thanks Lisa for her help, who once again remains modest, saying that it's Charlotte who learns quickly. Haruto asks about the water ball the dragon girl is maintaining, and she shows that she is using it to wash clothes. The boy is very impressed by the fact that Lisa is teaching magic to his sister and helping with household chores at the same time, so he thinks she's very competent. Haruto asks if she doesn't get tired with so many activities, but the girl says she likes to stay active and feels more relaxed that way. He apologizes for making her do so much, and even Charlotte worries that she might have caused a problem for Lisa, but she says that she actually enjoys taking care of the girl. The blonde is happy to hear that and says she wants to be friends with the dragon girl. Hermigo has no objections, so Lisa says she also wants to be her friend, and the two of them are very happy. Inside, Hermigo thinks about how kind Lisa is and how she can study and adapt easily to different situations. This gives him an idea this dragon girl could be the ideal assistant he was looking for. He calls her over, but before saying anything seeing the two girls together, Haruto gives up because he doesn't want to separate these newly formed friends. It's a shame to lose the perfect candidate, but upon further thought, Haruto believes that using those portal barriers might work. So Lisa would go with him to the capital as his assistant, and then return quickly to the castle. Therefore, all that remains is to focus on the mission of getting expelled from the academy as soon as possible. Sometime later, we see the young people and the maid at Haruto's resting house. Charlotte has already finished watching her favorite anime and decides to take a break from watching anything else who hasn't felt that way. Liz informs them that her break time is over, but before they leave, Haruto informs them that he will be going to the capital school next week. Upon hearing this, the blonde girl not only thinks about school but also about a secret student council, terrorism, and magical battles. So she tells Lisa to cancel all her plans for the day and inform the knights, summoning a round table emergency meeting. As strange as it sounds, shortly after, Charlotte gathers around a wooden table with Flay, Lisa, Johnny, and Jigen and says that this meeting is confidential and they must keep it a secret. She talks about her brother deciding to attend the capital school next week by his own choice. Flay is frustrated that Haruta didn't tell her first, but Charlotte says that she just found out as well. The redhead also thinks that there's nothing the master really needs to learn from mere humans and almost spills the beans about him being the reincarnation of the Demon King. However, Johnny prevents her from making a mistake. 
The problem is that Charlotte believes that the demon woman has some information about her brother that she doesn't know, but Flay doesn't say anything and only mentions that it's a demon secret. Fortunately, Johnny is in this meeting and even with the girl in shock, the skeleton regains control of the situation, stating that this is a minor thing and that she is surely above all of them in Haruto's heart, so he will probably tell her soon. So Charlotte continues the meeting saying that the real issue is that her brother decided to go on his own. She recalls a time when she was watching an I'm about school life and she asked Haruto what school was. He replied that it was an extremely scary and dangerous place. Upon hearing this story, the others are shocked and Charlotte starts making theories based on the anime she watched, suggesting the existence of a secret student council that recruits good students to lead them astray, even arranging magical battles with those who get in their way. In addition to all this madness, there must be some evil organization behind it capable of shaking the kingdom. In Charlotte's view, Haruto must want to fight against this under the alter ego of the Black Knight Shiva. Both Flay and Jenny end up completely believing this theory, taking it as the truth because only Haruto would be capable of dealing with such a problem. Charlotte already guesses that her brother will put up a teleportation door in the capital, so she wants to go with Flay and Lisa to gather information, while Johnny and Jigen should prepare pandemonium for what is to come. The Dragon Girl asks if they shouldn't talk to Haruto about this, but both Flay and Charlotte think that he has too much to worry about and it's better not to become another burden for him. Johnny also agrees if the meeting ends with this strange plan. Later, Lisa acts like a spy and reports everything to Haruto. He thanks her because he doesn't know what could have happened if she hadn't told him. When the Dragon Girl asks if he's really going to fight an evil organization, Haruto thinks about how she is so upright and to not hurt her feelings. He decides to answer convincingly that yes, he is, and that he has been acting in secret. Then he takes the opportunity to invite her as his assistant in the capital, using the excuse that this is a vital mission that only she can do for him. With a sense of responsibility, the dragon girl accepts, so Haruto is already relieved because things are going according to plan. Now we see some random moments from the daily life in the castle, like when the maids complain about some relationship problems, and Flay talks about literally cutting people, but fortunately the girls understand it as cutting ties. There is also the moment when Charlie asks why Flay's maid outfit is different from the others. She explains that when she received a standard outfit, it was too tight in the bust area, so she got a custom-made one. Another moment is when Charlotte sees the driving girl flying and asks if the demon woman can do it too. Flay says she can but is not used to it, so Charlotte asks her to teach her because she also wants to fly. Thus, the redhead jumps high into the air, which is a somewhat silly scene but leaves the girl excited. Then the girl's mother appears and says that she is too young to learn flying magic, which makes her very sad. However, Flay asks Haruto for help, and he conjures a plane for her, making the blonde girl happy and keeping her safe. One day, Charlotte invites Flay to the castle's hot tub, but the redhead says she doesn't need it and that to clean herself, she goes to a river and jumps in fully clothed. She gets clean but soaked, so she ends up shaking herself like a dog to dry off. Later. Haruto asks what Lisa did when she was reclusive, and the dragon girl says she basically just read and slept. Haruto thinks that's an ideal lifestyle, but she says that when she returned books, years had passed. Regarding food, she only ate once a week, so for Haruto, that was basically a diet. When Lisa asks how the magic door works, Haruto says he simply combined two barriers. But that's not a sufficient explanation for the dragon girl, who concludes that it's magic from another world. Sometime later, Haruto creates a device that measures mana levels, which is a sphere like the others shown before. He uses it to measure Flay and Lisa's mana. The redhead is at level 40 out of 77, while the dragon girl is at level 36 out of 71, which means they are very powerful. Charlotte is also not bad and impresses Haruto, because she is only at level 17, but has the potential to reach level 61 which is better than the queen who has the maximum level of 44. The boy comments that with some training, his sister will quickly reach the maximum level, but she says she can't because when she was a baby, even before walking or talking, she scared her mother by creating a fireball, so her mother decided to put a seal on her. Horvido was even more impressed by his sister being a true genius from birth. However, the dragon girl asks about her brother's level. Flay is confident that it's above level 100, but embarrassed, he says it's a secret because he still believes he's only at level 2, and that's his limit. And with that scene, these random comedy moments are concluded for now. On the day Haruto left for the capital, Marquis Gold advised him to be careful. Liza was somewhat restless because he had hidden his horns and she wasn't used to it. Meanwhile, Flay was depressed because she hadn't been chosen as Haruto's assistant, so Charlotte comforted her while telling her brother to do his best. In the meantime, Laius received a letter from Marion, the Marquis. Even before reading it, he imagined it must be a warning that Haruto had left for the capital. Marianne mentioned that she had worked hard to recommend the boy at Laius' request, so she asked what the reason was behind it. 
Laius replied that he wanted to know why Haruto was so strong. He explained that ever since they had faced each other, he had done everything to improve in both magic and swordsmanship, but he always felt like Haruto was surpassing him. So studying at the same school might help him understand that. Marion said that defeat had changed her brother, but he was still laid back. On the other hand, Laius talked about rumors of cultists causing trouble at school. Marion confirmed the rumors, mentioning that they were from the Lucifer Church, a cult disguised as a branch of the state religion, the Minja Church, could have a better name, right? She explained that this group had adopted extremist ideologies and rumors had it that they worshipped demons. It seemed that the cult members were only at the academy, but their influence was spreading throughout the kingdom. Moreover, some aristocrats were rumored to be joining the cult to provide financial resources. Laius knew that there were rumors about their mother contributing to these resources, but it was hard to tell what the woman wanted. She had been acting strangely for the past five years, around the time she received the collar. In a way, the prince was afraid of his mother and her methods as he felt she was becoming even more extreme. He mentioned that everyone knew the king and queen were not doing well currently, and it was possible that the Lucifer Church wanted to exploit this situation. He didn't want to believe it, but perhaps his mother wanted to eliminate their father. Marion, for some reason, thought that Haruto might change this situation. It was strange, but she was putting her hopes in the boy and his extraordinary power. She believed that maybe he could overcome an entire organization. Laius then talked about the stories of the Black Knight, the hero of Zenfis territory, said to be capable of defeating a dragon. Perhaps a piece like that could help solve this problem. At that moment, the queen entered the room, leaving the young ones startled as they hadn't seen her in a long time. She praised her daughter's beauty but suddenly attacked her for looking at her collar. Her psychological state was clearly affected, and she only let go of her daughter when Laius begged her to stop. The queen claimed it was just a joke and changed the subject to talk about the Marquis of Zenfis's son attending the same school as Laius. In an ironic tone, she mentioned that the boy might feel lonely coming to study so far away and advised Laius to make friends with him. But what she really wanted was for her son to gather any information he could about the Black Knight. She emphasized not telling anyone except her, fearing her mother's personality. The prince reluctantly agreed, but as she left the room, he imagined he had involved Haruto in something terrible. Speaking of Haruto, we see Charlotte in the secluded house, remembering that it's time for him to arrive in the city. He should have already left, but being smart, he took the carriage to this location as he had placed the portal barrier near the capital a few days ago, so he waited until today, the day he needed to arrive in the capital. Flay asked him again to reconsider her as an assistant, but he firmly refused. Charlotte then took responsibility for taking care of the redhead, while Haruto finally headed to the capital with the dragon girl. The door he created was located between some trees in the middle of a forest near the capital because it was the only place he found to hide the portal. As they exited the forest, they found a long path to the city. Haruto preferred not to fly to avoid drawing attention, but suddenly Liza spotted some people in a carriage fleeing from a bison. She thought the creature was hungry, but for Haruto, bison were herbivores. He could have ignored it, but he didn't want it to become a problem if Charlotte found out. Stuffy so transformed into the Black Knight and flew to rescue the people. When the carriage lost a wheel, he used a barrier to save a child's life. The people were relieved, but the creature kept charging, so a white-haired, red-eyed girl jumped out of the carriage to distract the beast while the others fled. Herndo thought that if she was really strong, he might not need to act. However, the creature reached her, and although she held on for a while, she was eventually thrown into the air. When the bison advanced again and was about to hit her, Haruto appeared just in time, knocking the creature down. The girl was unsure whether to ask who he was or introduce herself first, and Haruto immediately realized that something was off about her. Seeing that her shoulder was injured, he used a healing barrier to undo all the damage she had suffered. She felt that this was different from ordinary healing magic. Then the child who had been saved came to see her too. She said that it was this hero who saved her life, so the boy thanked him. Haruto introduced himself as Shiva, the enforcer of justice. Only the child was excited about the introduction, but that was fine with Haruto. Afterward, he repaired the vehicle and realized it was a cargo carriage. When he asked why they were traveling in it, the girl explained that it was the only means of transportation available to the poor. She also wanted to thank the hero with money, and despite Haruto's claim that a hero of justice doesn't seek rewards, she promised to pay him the next time they met. Now that everyone was safe and ready to go, the knight decided to take the bison back to the forest. The girl found it strange that he showed compassion even for the monster. But Haruto replied that the creature had done nothing to him. As someone so virtuous, she hoped there were more people who thought the same way. The two then said their goodbyes, and afterward, Haruto and Lisa took the creature back to the forest and fed it before continuing their journey. On the way to the city, the dragon girl expressed some suspicion about the white-haired girl, saying she seemed strange in some way. 
Harbigo thought he wouldn't stay in the capital for long, so he didn't intend to get involved with anyone. In the city, they encountered a long line at the school gate, where new students had to enter. Observing the behavior of the other newcomers, Haruto was already feeling the urge to go back home. But he had to do this, so there was no escape. Inside, he filled out a bunch of forms before heading to the dormitory. The place was beautiful and spacious, with a room even designated for his assistant. However, he couldn't feel excited in his school environment. As he couldn't relax there, he quickly created a door in the wall to go back home for now. In the secluded house, Charlotte and Flay greeted him as he returned, saying that the time in the capital must have been exhausting, and he must be hungry. The boy asked Flay to prepare something, and she eagerly agreed. However, Charlotte suggested dining at a restaurant in the capital. Hearing this, the redhead became nervous because she wanted to prepare something for her master, so she whispered something in Charlotte's ear that convinced her to take the boy out to eat. To avoid drawing too much attention, Charlotte had dressed as a demon woman, but her appearance remained the same, so Haruto used magic to make her tail and ears invisible, just as he had done with Lisa's horns. They headed to the capital, where the girl was excited to see so many shops and quickly chose a restaurant for them to eat together. During the meal, Lisa continued to take care of Charlotte as usual, and suddenly, she pulled out a city map to help them understand the city's geography. Haruto hadn't quite grasped the reason, but Charlotte quickly assigned regions to each of them. Flay was responsible for the south, Lisa for the west, and Charlotte and Haruto for the east. He thought his sister just wanted to go sightseeing, but she explained that they needed to investigate the area since a potential enemy would have the geographical advantage. For now, they just needed to familiarize themselves with the map so they shouldn't draw attention. However, Haruto didn't think he could trust Flay to be discreet, but he decided to go along with his sister's playful plan for now. So they left the restaurant, and when Flay and Lisa headed to their assigned regions, Charlotte told Haruto that they were going on a date. Inside, he felt a bit desperate, but quickly thought that it must be influenced by Anime, and his sister probably didn't know what the word meant. Anyway, as he found her very cute and had never had this kind of experience in his previous life, he decided to go along with it to make his little sister happy. They strolled through the city, visiting tourist spots and residential areas before stopping at a jewelry store Charlotte wanted to check out. Haruto bought a pendant she liked. Afterward, they passed by a fountain, where the girl accidentally bumped into the white-haired girl. Both Charlotte and the girl apologized politely. When she saw Haruto, she thought she might have seen him before, but he claimed they hadn't met. She also remembered sensing a large amount of mana from him earlier. Haruto then said his mana level was only at level 2, and calling that large mana seemed like a joke. The girl didn't know if that was true, but he insisted he wouldn't lie about something so embarrassing. So she apologized, saying she must have been mistaken due to the fatigue from a long journey. At that moment, Haruto recalled that she seemed in a hurry when she bumped into the girl, so the girl remembered she was on her way to a job interview and hurried off. Afterward, Charlotte seemed pensive, and when Haruto asked what was wrong, she said there was something mysterious about the girl. It was hard to explain, but she didn't seem like a normal person. Hearing this, he remembered that Lisa had also said something similar and wondered if monsters and people with high mana had a different sense. In any case, he didn't intend to do anything about it because starting the next day, he planned to go into seclusion. After a few days at this school, Haruto's clone informs him that there will be a proficiency test before the admission ceremony, but he refuses to take it. He's been confined to his room for days, so he pleads for some empathy. The real Haruto admits he hadn't thought about the tests he'd have to take, but sees it as a chance to demonstrate incompetence and get expelled before the classes even start. He becomes excited and decides to resolve this. On his way to the test location, the boy moves cautiously, as he considers this environment hostile and dangerous. Suddenly, a school staff member leads him to an empty classroom. The place is so large that Haruto thinks it could accommodate about 100 students. He starts to think about whether he'll end up studying in this room and making many friends, but this thought depresses him because it's precisely this kind of interaction he wants to avoid. With that in mind, the boy is even more determined to perform poorly on the test. The man hands him the papers and tells him to take as much time as he needs. He can't even understand the first few pages, so instead of making up answers, Horudo starts writing that he doesn't know. This speeds up the process significantly, but when he reaches a section about barrier magic, he knows it might be strange to claim he knows nothing, so in this part he answers correctly based on his experiences with that type of magic. Then there's a section about ancient magic, which he has studied a bit to figure out ways to stay reclusive. The boy recalls things he read from an author with a very long name and begins writing about it in the responses. It's only then that he realizes he's been answering on autopilot. In any case, he submits the papers and the staff member calls him to measure his mana in another room. He explains that his maximum level is 2, but as it's a standard procedure, the man doesn't offer any options. Thus, Haruto is taken to another room, 
where he encounters a short person with tiny glasses. She examines the boy from various angles and suddenly compliments his hair. Inside, he wonders who this child is, who then introduces herself as Terrieta Lusanel, a researcher of ancient magic. As if she can read Harudo's thoughts, she guesses he was surprised by her size and scolds him for being too rude. Next, the researcher says that regardless of who recommended him, even if it was the king, if he displeases her, he'll be sent home even before the admission ceremony. The boy expresses enthusiasm, surprising Tirietta, who had expected a reaction of fear, not hope. Nevertheless, the girl likes strange guys but also has some peculiar attitudes so it's all good. Gradually, Haruto comes to terms with the situation and she takes the test papers to check his knowledge of magic. Quickly, her expression changes and she says they'll measure his mana. Thinking that the result will still be two, Haruto concentrates his magic on the crystal sphere, which shines brightly before shattering. The boy finds this very strange, but as he broke something potentially valuable, he imagines that Tirieta might be angry enough to expel him. However, she finds it spectacular because it suggests he has so much mana that the crystal couldn't contain it. The assistant mentions that he heard the student's maximum mana level is two, but Tirieta explains that there are exceptions to everything and the logic behind the major crystals hasn't been deciphered yet, so as researchers, they need to pursue the facts before discussing powers. And that's not all. She comments that the questions about real-level magic were too much for him. Aruto is hearing this definition of real-level for the first time. Regardless, Tiria appreciates Haruto's honesty in answering I don't know to those questions. As for the sections on barrier magic and ancient magic, they were very well done, almost resembling something she herself wrote. Hearing this, Koruno realizes that Terrieta Luciano is the long-named author of the books he used for studying. Therefore, there is no doubt the researcher will keep him in the school. To Haruto, all of this seems like a game. The girl wants him to join her research, but the student declines immediately, despite her having a very good laboratory. Nothing can convince him. He returns to his room and tells the clone everything that happened. He leaves the rest for the clone to handle. Sometime later, the clone, who also identifies as Haruto C, receives a visit from Charlotte, who hands him a large gun as something the real Haruto sent. As if it were part of a spy movie, the girl wishes the clone good luck in carrying out his duty. Haruto C still doesn't want to attend the ceremony. He reflects on having the same memories as Haruto, but lacking mana and essentially being empty inside. At least the original put a protective spell on the clone and gave him this weapon, probably for self-defense. Nevertheless, Haruto C feels he has no freedom of choice. After the admission ceremony, he's the first to rush down the corridor to return to the dormitory quickly. Suddenly, he sees a group of cheerful people and is determined not to get involved with them. When the blonde guy in the group calls out, he thinks it's directed at him, but it's actually aimed at the girl with white hair. Without even looking, Haruto C continues walking but ends up bumping into the girl's bust. Before this can escalate, the blonde guy asks how they dare pass him without greeting him. The girl apologizes but says she didn't read anything about that in the academy's manual. What the guy wants is for her to bow to him because he's the vice president. When the girl shows that he's still talking about the school rules, the blonde calls Haruto C and asks him to explain that the clone doesn't know anything and doesn't want to get involved. So his reaction is to pretend to have a stomachache, but this only infuriates the vice president who has already realized it's just a lie. When the guy starts casting magic, Haruto C runs away, but there's no escaping the fire attack that hits him in the back. Even after receiving the attack head-on, the clone manages to get up thanks to the original Haruto's protection spell, but the problem is that, seeing this, the blonde is surprised that the guy didn't even get injured after receiving the attack. Hearing this, the clone starts pretending that he's feeling fine, but he wasn't even supposed to be able to stand, so the performance doesn't help. The girl goes to him and reveals that she doesn't know how to handle the situation. Her top priority is to apologize for involving the boy in this situation. Secondly, she wants to calm the bully down but she can't even understand why he's angry. Inside, the clone realizes that this girl has more communication problems than he does, as she doesn't even understand the situation she's in. Even more irritated, the Vice President Schneidel prepares an even more powerful attack that could potentially be fatal. Hergado C acts quickly, telling the girl to run and drawing his gun to make a shot strong enough to push himself backward. Without looking back, the clone runs away while the blonde yells because his arm was injured. In his room, he tells the real Haruto what happened and that he was later pursued by the researcher. Haruto tells the clone to rest and takes his place for now, thinking about this unexpected magical battle. Furthermore, a little later, he receives a challenge to a duel, which he initially declines. However, the messenger warns him that it's a duel according to noble etiquette, and refusing would be a dishonor even to Marquis Zenfis. Moreover, losing on purpose would be worse than refusing, so he needs to do his best in this. 
Back in his room, Haruto is frustrated with everything. Being the vice president, the blonde guy must be very strong and the clone only survived because he held back. In any case, he can only think that he will lose pathetically and doesn't want to feel pain. Then he uses a barrier to see outside where he observes the girl with white hair talking to the messenger before they enter a carriage so the boy concludes that she's going to the noble's house. Later on, we see her on Marquis Zafin's property talking to Schneidel and asking him to cancel the duel because she considers herself guilty of everything. Especially since the blonde guy is injured due to the boy's attack and not in a condition to fight. This irritates the guy, and he even splashes one of the maids, questioning if she can't heal the injury faster. This shows what kind of person he is and Haruto, who is not Mangeev, is watching everything from a distance. He is impressed by the girl's courage in going there alone. Meanwhile, the vice president scolds her for not bowing before making the request, but from the way she apologizes, he says it's not even funny because she's not even embarrassed. The girl asks what she should do so he suggests she dance without clothes. She says that would be too much, but Schneidel considers it a low price to pay to improve his mood. Strangely, she accepts. After removing a few pieces of clothing, she starts feeling embarrassed. At school, Haruto sees that this is going too far and thinks she's foolish to do all this. Before the scene can continue, the environment suddenly turns dark and the Black Knight appears, tossing her some clothes and telling her to have more respect for herself. He says he'll send her back to the dorm to get dressed and leave. The blonde guy doesn't know what's happening in this darkness so the knight appears again explaining that they're in a special dimension and none of the others will appear in this place. With Schmeidel confused, he introduces himself once more as Shiva, the enforcer of justice, and says he will judge his sins. The blonde guy thinks it's a joke and prepares for combat, but Karuto makes him feel pain in his arm and places a magic blocker on him. He then starts listing the guy's sins. The first was unfairly picking a fight with a new student and causing a disturbance. Schneidel tries to justify it as mere guidance, but it only shows he's guilty. The second scene was trying to use a duel to publicly punish a new student. The guy attempts to justify it again, saying it's a respectful noble's act, but the knight says that if he says he can't do it, then he can't. Ironically, the blonde guy says it's tyranny, but Haruto points out that Schneidel does the same thing. Finally, the third sin was the harassment against the girl with white hair. Therefore, the punishment is that he has to live with a magic blocker for a while. If he tries to remove it or use magic, it will go even deeper into his arm. Disbelieving, the guy tries to use magic to remove it and feels even more pain. In this way, Haruto says he won't be able to participate in the duel the next day and tells him to reflect on everything that he wants the blocker to be removed. Then everyone returns to the room. The servants try to heal his arm, but it only causes more pain and the blonde guy is so humiliated that he vows to seek revenge. After the incident with Hafen, the entire faculty hovers over Haruto. They're all impressed because he defeated the bully in that brief conflict where the clone managed to escape. They question how someone at level 2 pulled it off and even suggest he should be retested. When he leaves the room, poor Haruto recalls thinking he'd be expelled when he was called by the faculty, but instead, they just praised him. Furious, Haruto blames the veteran and tries to think of a way to get compensated for this. Even in the hallway, students are making comments about it and wanting to be left alone, he starts running. However, he passes by the researcher, Harrietta Lusamel, who grabs him by his clothes. Before she can begin speaking, the boy already declines the proposal that was about to be made. Nonetheless, she mentions the conversation they had the day before and makes the proposal again. It turns out the conversation they had was with the clone, so Haruto claims not to remember what it was about anymore. However, this isn't enough to get rid of her as she doesn't know when to give up. With a piece of chalk, the researcher starts drawing on the ground while explaining that the academy has two types of curriculum and Haruto needs to choose one. The knight course is where they learn to use magic in training rooms, geared toward those who want to become knights or soldiers in the kingdom's army. The other course is for researchers, where a person develops magic in the laboratory and investigates ways to use it. Based on the admission test, Tirieta knows that Haruto has an interest in ancient magic, so she suggests that the best choice would be to join her laboratory. The boy continues to refuse and she keeps insisting, just as we see Prince Laius approaching. He recognizes Haruto and rushes to greet him, but out of reflex, Haruto grabs his arm and topples the prince to the ground. Only when Marian calls out to Laius does Haruto notice her presence and recognizes her as the princess. He hadn't noticed before because the guy is now muscular. Nevertheless, the prince acknowledges Haruto's strength and after releasing him, Haruto asks formally what they want with him. Laius tells him not to be so formal, however, Haruto says he was talking to the princess. This infuriates the muscle head, but Marion quickly asks Haruto if he has decided which course he will take. When he says he hasn't, the princess invites him to join the same laboratory as her. 
Laius argues that it's not fair because he also wanted Haruto to stay with him. With that, Professor Tirieta intervenes, saying that the boy is going to her laboratory. They continue to argue about where Haruto will go until the prince tells him that the professor's laboratory is the only place he should avoid because her research stinks and never produces decent results. The researcher claims the problem isn't the results but that foolish people can't understand it. However, Laius uses this statement to exemplify Tirieta's personality. Soon, the three of them press Haruto about his decision until the white-haired girl appears, saying she wants to talk to him. Haruno realizes that this is his chance to get out of this situation and takes her arm, saying he had agreed to something with her. He leaves with her while Marianne questions Laius about the girl's connection to Haruto. Outside, Haruto apologizes for pulling her away so suddenly. She gets straight to the point and asks if he's the same person she met yesterday because to her, he seems entirely different. Surprised, Haruto activates an alert mode by reflex, creating a barrier around them. The problem is that the girl can sense the difference between him and the clone, so she's not just an ordinary person. Furthermore, she comments on the barrier. Haruto asks if she can see, but she says no, only feel vaguely. Concerning the difference in him from the day before, she says she didn't sense any mana then, but now she feels immense pressure. Haruno might think the girl is just highly sensitive to mana, but he remembers that the last person who talked about feeling mana pressure from him was Flay. To confirm, he asks if she's some kind of demon, and the girl innocently denies it. Haruto dispels the barrier and to answer her question, he doesn't provide many explanations, just says to consider him the same person. With that, she takes the opportunity to apologize for involving him in trouble, thanks him for protecting her from Schneidel, and asks him to be her friend. Haruno accepts, somewhat confused, and the girl becomes very grateful and relieved, saying she's never had friends before. He asks how that's possible, and she starts to tell their story. She was abandoned at birth, which shocks Haruto but she also reveals she was abandoned by the people who had taken her in, and this happened four times. Haruto realizes that her past is even worse than his. The only reason she can think of is that maybe it's because she has the ability to communicate. Haruto knows that for ordinary people, this could indeed be frightening. She continues her story saying she was taken in by a monastery but was mistreated. The only priest who was kind to her left when she was five years old. As the place was already isolated from the rest of the world, she has little common sense of human society and therefore wants friends to learn these things. Hermuto then says she chose the wrong person. He doesn't take pride in it, but he also has no friends and has always been reclusive, so he lacks common sense too. The problem is, this only makes the girl more enthusiastic about the idea that they can learn together, as having this in common is a good reason for them to become friends. The word friend reminds Haruto of the bullies from his past life, but at least he figures he can use the girl to avoid the boring aspects of school. So he asks if she has chosen a course, and she replies that she picked the ancient magic laboratory. Knowing it's the one run by that professor, Haruto gives in because he doesn't have many options. He says he'll go to the same laboratory since friends should stick together. The girl is very happy that he wants to be her friend even after hearing all of this. For Haruto, her smile is comparable to Charlotte's, but he doesn't want to be deceived. Anyway, Haruto says that even with this history, no one has introduced themselves, so he tells her his name is Haruto Zenfis, the son of the Marquis. The girl comments that she forgot that in society, you're supposed to introduce yourself before communicating. So she finally reveals her name, but the scene cuts off for now. Meanwhile, Charlotte, Lisa, and Flay are taking a bath. The blonde says she misses her brother, and the demon woman is by the master's side. Suddenly, the girl mentions that a light came to her, indicating that something interesting is happening with Haruto. After that, she goes to see her brother. Flay wonders why the master doesn't allow her to go there too, but we know it's because the redhead would surely cause some trouble. Talking with Lisa, she mentions that her previous job was to gather various demons for the demon king. At the time, she was already working with him. She also tells how the Mao was kind and put demons and monsters first, which caused conflicts with other demons regarding how to treat humans. The demon king's dream was to create a paradise where humans and demons could coexist, and he may have even planned to lose to the light princess because when she invaded the castle, he made all the demons flee as a precaution. Flay thinks he sacrificed himself for his ideals and planned to be reborn as a human to try to change human thinking by becoming one of them. The redhead never liked that way of thinking, but the strangest thing is that he was born as the son of the Light Princess herself. Flay recalls that Haruto said he lost his memories of his past life, and she thinks it was to discard the knave's side that prevented him from being ruthless. She also comments on his habit of abbreviating the names of species and speaking of names, Lisa says she doesn't know the Demon King's old name. The redhead warns her not to use his name in vain, but reveals that the name is Erisphilia. At the same time, the girl tells Haruto the same name. He finds it too long and nicknames her Iris. 
With that, the girl remembers that she also had the habit of shortening others' names. Before the boy leaves, Iris asks if he has chosen his classes, so she suggests they do it together for efficiency. So she invites him to her room, but only when they reach the door does Haruto realize that this could create some misunderstandings. Nevertheless, as they are already there, he wants to get things done, so that the girl can leave soon. When he opens the door, Haruto is greeted by Charlotte, who is surprised and thinks the girl is his girlfriend, but he quickly corrects her and says she's a friend. The blonde is relieved and says that the light that came to her was about the friend. Thinking he'll have many suitors soon, she wants to prepare to become his second wife. Haruto finds this unexpected but figures it's a childish thing, and that when she grows up, she might develop the typical sisterly attitude of hating her brother. Then he introduces his sister and friend, and later, Haruto informs Charlotte that they have things to do. The young ones start filling out the forms, and when he gets bored, he asks his sister to finish the job. With everything ready, Haruto doesn't even bother to read, and his confidence impresses both Iris and Charlotte. The girl then asks if he didn't enroll in the academy to accomplish something. The blonde replies that her brother's goal goes beyond the academic level, but they can't reveal the real objective, even though she's a friend. The girl finishes by saying that he already transcends the concept of learning. This makes Iris think he's even more amazing. Haruto takes the opportunity to ask Charlotte what she came to do at school, and she just says that she has already achieved her goal, so it's time to leave. To prevent Iris from noticing the portal, Haruto covers her eyes. When the girl asks about the sound of the door not coming from the entrance, he tells her not to worry about the details. With the task completed, the boy says he's counting on Iris, but deep down, Haruto hopes it's only until he gets expelled. The day of the start of classes arrives, and as expected, Haruto isn't feeling particularly excited. Charlotte goes over the day's schedule with him. At this moment, the guy realizes he's in Class C, a mid-level class, which Charlotte believes is due to some exemptions from the entrance exams. However, he might be able to switch to Class A depending on his performance in the tests. Upon looking at the paper more closely, the boy realizes he's enrolled in advanced-level classes, which Charlotte selected, thinking it would be easy for him. Initially, Haruto thinks this is bad, but then he imagines that if the teachers have very high expectations for him, it could be the perfect opportunity to disappoint them. Before the boy leaves, the blonde girl gives him a farewell hug, wishing him a good day at school. When Haruto arrives at school, he goes with Lisa and meets Iris, Thankfully, she now has a name because it was difficult to keep calling her the girl with white hair every time. The boy introduces Lisa as his assistant, which makes the girl contemplate something before they exchange greetings. Iris is surprised to learn that Haruto is in Class C, considering she's in Class A, and she's sure will join her soon, considering that exam scores will be taken into account. After the girl moves away, Lisa questions Haruto if Iris is really human because upon close observation, she can't tell if she's a demon or a human. Haruto is confident that she's neither a demon nor a threat, so they shouldn't worry about her. When the guy enters the classroom, all the students are looking at him because of the incident with Shinidal. The teacher speaks up, telling the students that this is Class C, the most average in terms of grades, which means they have a chance to improve or drop, so he's going to start with a test. Haruto sees this as a great opportunity to show how incompetent he is and bid farewell to this classroom very soon. The problem is that the content is too easy. Haruto remembers that when Charlotte even when she was younger, began her studies as a child of prodigy, she covered this material in the first six months. To him, it seems like the questions are from content that even children can solve. The boy concludes that the teacher wants to reassure everyone with these easy questions after the intimidating speech about the possibility of failing. However, this makes it difficult for him to decide how to handle the test. If he makes too many mistakes on easy questions, it will raise suspicions that he's doing it on purpose. So he decides to strike a balance and try to score 60 points, making some silly errors. At the end of the test, the teacher reviews the students' answers and comments that the results are very poor, with the class average being 20 points. However, this was expected because even students from class B would have an average of around 50 points. Keeping this in mind, the teacher congratulates Haruto for scoring above average. The boy is surprised by this information, but quickly understands that it's not that the students are dumb or that he's a genius. It's just that Charlotte is exceptionally gifted. To top it off, the teacher says he will recommend him for Class A in the next class. In Class A, Haruto meets Laius and Iris, who are competing for his attention. Soon, the teacher, a blonde woman named Oratoria Belcom, arrives. She specializes in elemental theory and seems quite stern. The first thing the woman does is intimidate the three newcomers, who, despite being first-year students, have enrolled in an advanced class, and she intends to expel them the first time they can't answer one of her questions. Furthermore, she doesn't seem to like the fact that Haruto and Iris have joined Hiriata's lab. The first lesson is about primary elements, sub-elements, and quantification. 
She asks Iris to place her hand on the sphere that indicates her affinity with all elements, and that she's at level 05 out of 35. Seeing this, the teacher invites her to join her lab to develop her skills further, but the girl declines. The woman continues the lesson, explaining that the element in which one has the highest proficiency is known as the primary element. In Iris's case, it's the chaos element, and below that are her sub-elements, but this is all the crystal can show. Considering that the primary element has a value of 100%, determining the values of sub-elements is very difficult, despite ongoing research. Internally, Haruta finds this strange because he can clearly see the affinity levels. Oratoria continues to explain that quantification is challenging because circumstances can change the values. She uses an example of a mystery regarding people with fire sub-elements. When a spell is used to increase their muscles, it's discovered that there's an increased rate compared to other fire spells. The woman then asks Leia's to explain why this happens. He tries to get a logical answer, but it contradicts the research on the subject. So, Haruto takes a guess, saying it's because of hidden properties. Hearing this, the teacher seems skeptical of what he said. It turns out that he can see some strange terms with his calculator, and only mentioned it to the house girls. When he says he thinks there are hidden properties related to elements, the teacher reveals that this information is part of the research by a guy named Wee Ool. Wee Ool is a mysterious person who sends research papers from time to time, and these papers are far ahead of common research and suggest the possibility of invisible properties. As the academy proceeds cautiously, this information hasn't been disclosed, not even to the royal family. So it's very strange that Haruto knows about it. This level of analysis shows that the guy is very talented, so the teacher asks him to quit the ancient magic lab, which she considers useless, and come work with her. But just like Iris, Haruto also declines. The teacher even thinks he might be Wieshuel himself. The boy denies it, but knowing that Wieshuel means white owl in German, he imagines it might be some invention by Charlotte. After that, we see Terrieta receiving Iris and Haruto see. She's excited because with them, the lab can remain open until they graduate. To celebrate, she brings the assistant Polkos to prepare a welcome party. Haruto C isn't too thrilled, but the original Haruto was already exhausted. Suddenly, Polkos comes across Shinaido lying on the floor. The researcher reveals that he appeared the day before because he was hit by a strange spell unlike anything she had seen before, so she suspected it was ancient magic and came to consult the teacher. The problem is that during the investigation, the guy ended up reaching a point of exhaustion. In any case, she thinks he could be a good subject for the study of ancient magic. The teacher tells Iris to touch the guy's shoulder, and she feels that there's something solid connected to him, something invisible like a cylinder. Tyria explains that there are two cylinders, one on each side, and when someone tries to heal this wound, the cylinders seem to attract each other, squeezing the shoulder tighter. The most interesting part is that inanimate objects seem to pass through the cylinder. With this, Iris concludes that it's non-elemental magic, and the researcher confirms that it's some sort of non-elemental magic barrier. This level of deduction impresses Haruto C, but at least there's nothing to indicate that it has anything to do with his identity. Now the teacher asks him about the biggest difference between modern and ancient magic. The guy asks if it has something to do with being older, but Iris says that ancient magic is of a non-elemental type and being lost, it contains many mysteries. Tyrieta confirms this and adds that ancient magic can be maintained without a constant supply of mana, so the fact that the guy has been dealing with this issue for some time now is another clue about the type of magic that was used. It seems strange for someone in this modern era to use ancient magic, as it's from the mystical era, and a person would need a minimum mana level of 80 to do it. When asked by Tyrieta, Iris says that although she visited Shin Idol's house on the night of the incident, she doesn't know who did it, so the researcher thinks the only way is to ask the blonde guy. Even though he's weakened and still refused to talk about it the day before, an impatient Tyrieta slaps him to get some answers, but when the guy realizes, he just questions why the other two are in this place. Ignoring the questions and demands of the blonde guy, a teacher says she can't solve his problem and only the person who cast this magic can remove it. So the only way is for him to tell everything. The problem is, he doesn't know either, as the person had a modified voice and was wearing a complete disguise. With that, the teacher says, there's a person who fits the profile. She tells Haruto about a justice hero who's said to have appeared in the border province a few years ago, and the description matches Shin Idol's information. Even though he's pressured because this hero only operated in that province and now suddenly appeared in the capital right when he entered the school, he continues to pretend not to understand. The researcher becomes increasingly threatening, driven by the possibility that this guy knows more about ancient magic than she does. It's at this moment that the original Haruto, dressed as Shiva, appears, showing that he had been watching for some time and helping Haruto see escape suspicion. Tyrieta is very happy with the presence of the Justice Hero and believes that he already knows that the blonde guy is part of an evil organization. 
In reality, Haruto only found out about this now. But he confirms that it's true. That's why he appeared in the capital. Tsurumi tells Shinata that he'll remove the spell the next day if he cancels the duel as he promised. After saying that, Haruto prepares to leave but realizes that he's trapped by rings of dark earth. They were created by the teacher without him noticing. Using the status screen, he sees that her primary element is earth, and her strongest sub-element is darkness, a combination that makes the rings stronger than earth alone. The woman reveals that she has 271 questions for him before he can leave, but the guy easily breaks the rings and immobilizes the teacher completely. Instead of being terrified, the researcher is impressed by Shiva's power, and says that the number of questions has now increased to 824. Polkos becomes increasingly perplexed by the woman's behavior, who, as a last resort, even offers her chastity in exchange for answers. Of course it doesn't work, and Haruto tells her to stop investigating him. The researcher asks to be released soon because she needs to use the bathroom, but the guy only undoes it when she promises to stop the investigation and apologizes for everything. Then he leaves, and now that she can move, the researcher rushes to the bathroom. 